lights. If that's is that me? Ah, great. Okay, so <laughs> I think this is very strange to have these multiplying images on the screen. Um, all right, so uh, this is where we ended last time. We are still in the Late Bronze Age. We're in around 13, the year is around 1300 BCE. If you were inside any of the palatial compounds at Mycenae, at Pylos, at Tiryns, on the walls you would see frescoes, large painted frescoes, and there would be all sorts of subjects in these frescoes, uh, hunters, um, young men running along, animals, but the most prominent figures in all of the frescoes would be women. Uh, sometimes they have um, crowns on their heads, sometimes they're, they're carrying, or sometimes they have who knows what this is on her head. Uh, and uh, sometimes they're, they're carrying things, like this lady from Mycenae who's carrying torches. Sometimes they're just very regally marching along, like this lady, here's the beautiful side of her gown. And you would definitely get the idea that uh, women were very important. You would also get that idea from any of the small shrines that exist at all of these places, just as these many palatial centers had in common a language, a script, the kind of um, architectural form for their main administrative center, burial, um, and the important burial forms, those tholos tombs, frescoes, pots, the kind of decoration on the pots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are idols, little terracotta idols. Well, some of them aren't actually so little. Some of them are pretty sizable. Um, that have been found in shrines. Uh, these two happen to be one from Mycenae and one from Tiryns, but at other Mycenaean Late Bronze Age sites, um, they're similar. They're obviously ladies, since their breasts are delineated. This they in these kind of I don't know Xena warrior queen guises, <laughs> and um, uh, sometimes they the ladies have crowns on their heads, and we don't really know who they are. We don't know if they are intended to be goddesses or votaries or priestesses, but what we do know is that just like with the frescoes, there is an important role that women play in some aspect of ritual at all of these discrete power centers. So, same um, uh, administrative setup at all of them, and we can reconstruct um, these lavishly decorated interior spaces. And we might speculate about who it was actually who sat on the throne on the side here. In this reconstruction drawing, it's a man, but a number of scholars have speculated that in fact this is not a throne room per se, but a room for ritual, and the person who would have been seated on the throne would have been a woman. All, a woman. all of the evidence that we have for gender roles here has as the most important uh, ritual person a female rather than a male. Oh, that's the evidence at all these places. Now, this looks like a pretty strong, powerful, well-organized, well-established culture and civilization. And for a while, it was. There are hints, starting in the middle of the 13th century, around 1250 BCE, of hints of um, anxiety or possible trouble. So for example, here on the citadel at Tiryns, here's the Megaron unit, on the citadel at Tiryns. In the walls, the walls are carved out and turned into gallery spaces for storage. That's what these are here, these gallery spaces for, for storage of, of food. And at Mycenae, this is a drawing of the citadel at Mycenae. At Mycenae, the shrine, the shrine where those little votaries came from, which, which is uh, this building here, house with idols. The, all of the idols, this is how archaeologists actually found them, all of the idols were um, put in this small back room, this small back room here, 
and the door was plastered shut. When archaeologists excavated there, they found 50 terracotta idols all crammed into the room, and the door was plastered shut and whitewashed. So per, as suggesting that uh, whoever was here was afraid that there was going to be um, some trouble, and they wanted these important items to be protected. In addition, oh, and here's a picture of the way that they, uh, the way that the archaeologists found them. You can see a lot of these little idols all, all smashed up in, in a corner. Um, oh, wait. In addition, uh, there was an additional sort of back entryway uh, created at Mycenae, and it's, it's here at number 11 up on, on the plan. And if you would be up on the top of the mound, you would, uh, this, is, this is the entryway into it, and it provided a way for somebody on the mound to access a spring that was down at the bottom of the mound without having to go outside the walls. And this was built towards the end of the 13th century, and it suggests, again, like the galleries at Tiryns, that maybe the people who were living here were worried and thought they might need to be inside the walls, but they didn't want to be without the ability to get water. At Pylos, the palace at Pylos, where there had been a lot of ways in and out. It's a very open plan. So you see, in addition to the main way in, which is here, um, there's ways in up here at the top and, and down through here. There's even a sideway in to the main Megaron right here and sideways in up here. Sideways here and up here. But and around the middle of the 13th century, all of those were blocked up so that it was much more difficult to get in to the palace compound casually. Now, instead, the main way was a, a more well-guarded way. Even so, in around the year 1200, all of the Mycenaean palaces were destroyed. The palace at Pylos was burned. You're looking at two rooms in which oil jars had been stored. The, the, the hearth of the Megaron is, is there. These are two rooms that are immediately behind that. And um, these are large jars that had been set inside these, these benches, these plastered benches. And uh, they had been turned into oil bombs, just like you had set gasoline cans on fire. The rooms had completely burned, and in fact, the entire palace had completely burned. At Tiryns, the citadel was destroyed by almost certainly an earthquake in the year 1200 and not rebuilt. At Mycenae, the citadel was burned. It's, um, there's dis active disagreement among archaeologists whether the proximate cause is natural or man-made. But what is clear is that the citadel top, the Megaron, was not rebuilt. Seemingly in one fell swoop, all of these linking pieces of this strong, well-established world disappeared. They didn't, I don't really mean that's not true. They didn't really disappear. They just, no new ones were built, and no old ones continued to be used. So Tholos tombs, no new ones built, and no new burials in the old Tholos tombs. The practice of burying important people in Tholos tombs stops. Palace art stops. Palace cult stops. It just disappears along with the palaces. Linear B disappears. And in fact, for 400 years, there is no evidence of writing whatsoever in Greece. It is effectively a dark age in terms of historical records because the people were illiterate. There was no writing. 
This writing style, this linear B style, is a little bit complicated. There are over 50 signs. It's, it's, it's pretty messy. A very small cadre of people knew how to write linear B. And when those, peop those people stopped training people, the systems that deploy linear B are no longer in place, so there's no longer any need for it. And, and the, um, there are no more texts. Around the year 1200, certainly 11, 1180, 1170, into the 12th century, these regions of Greece, Boeotia, Attica, the Argolid, Laconia, and Messenia, that had had intact, sometimes multiple, palatial centers, are so depopulated that it's difficult to find traces of anybody living there. But Greece is not abandoned as a country, as a zone. The zones of Elis and Attica see an increase in population. And we are pretty sure that the population increases in Elis and Attica are at least some of the people who have lived in Messenia, Laconia, the Argolid, and Boeotia. That is, the depopulation of those, of those other zones does not mean that everybody just up and left Greece. Some of those people just moved. Now, This world is gone. Writing is gone. How will you remember it? How will you remember it? What are the ways in which memory of this civilization, your own past, Are, are handed down, are revealed to the next generations. What are the ways? Have a quick chat with somebody sitting next to you. Come up with at least two. And if somebody comes in late, just to, before you leave, like at the end of class, make sure you come in. Because I mean, if we're handing stuff out at the beginning, and if people are coming in late, they might not know that. So yeah, I thanks. I will. Out. Yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Okay. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever I do. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good idea. Okay, did you come up with something? Stories or artwork? Stories, stories, excellent. Absolutely, stories. I mean, doesn't everybody have some elderly relative that they could stop listening to those stories? Elderly relatives love to do that. They love to tell you the stories about when they were little and the great things that they did and how, you know, they walked through snow to get to school and all that stuff. So, <laughs> right? Stories, absolutely. And we are pretty sure that there were stories that were handed down. The way that they were handed down was the best two mechanisms for handing a story down orally. You rhyme it, in other words, it's poetry, and you sing it. Oral song. How do we know? Because we have it. The Iliad and the Odyssey. Oral song. Finally written down. Many hundreds of years later. But the origins of many of the parts of these two stories 
is that world that we just left behind. So that's absolutely one of the ways. Art could be, but we just don't have the evidence for it. We don't, in other words, have evidence of murals or sculptures or representations. The, the know-how seems to be gone. Certainly the impetus is gone. The structures that might have allowed for the placement of art, large buildings, um, the world that would have supported it. You know, if you're an artist, you're not out in the field farming. Somebody else is getting your food. Well, if everybody is living down at sort of ground zero level and farming, ain't that many people going to be able to be hanging out, making art. So we don't, so it could have been, but we don't, but we don't have it. We don't have it. So what, so what's something else? Material possessions, that is, things that you might hang on to, like heirlooms, to prove to your disbelieving grandchildren that uh, it really was great. Although as time goes on, one generation, two, four, six, 200 years, things will be smaller and smaller, less impressive. What else? Tradition in the sense of so so behaviors, rituals, perhaps, perhaps. How would we know? We would look for evidence of similar ideas, behaviors, linking cultural traits in these later remains. And we are going to look for those. We'll see if we find them. What else? So that in a way, that's similar to, to that's a, one specific category of tradition. In other words, we, we may look to see if indeed one of the ways that the survivors held on to the past was to hold on to some specific ways of the past. But let's say it's 200 years later now. What might be another uh, mode that would allow you to remember? So, so those are all small pieces. Those are all, those are all small things. Uh, and if you're lucky, you, you may have a family that has something like that. Architecture. You know those buildings and walls and tombs that I'm showing you? You know why I can show you? Because they're still there. If they're there now, they were there then. No archaeologist re-dug up the walls of Tyrans. The walls of Tyrans have been standing, impressing people, dazzling them with the size of those stones ever since they were built. So to somebody 100 years, 200 years after the collapse of the Mycenaean world, that world is gone, but that city is standing. The Tholos tombs, standing. The citadel walls, standing. The two biggest pieces that remain to help people not just remember, because after a while memory, not necessarily so reliable, but visualize, imagine that world where the songs that were sung and the structures that still stood. But those traditions, those practices, religious practices, administrative practices, social structures, the world in which they existed, that world is gone. And the people who are left, these folks who are living in Elis and Attica, they have a charge. They didn't sign up for it, but it's the world they were born into to create a new world, to create a new culture. 
to create new patterns and relations and new ways of signaling to one another what those are. Now, how is it that we know that a lot of these people who lived in Elis and Attica are some of the same people? There are really two primary ways that we know. One is that eventually, when people start to write again, 400 years later, the language in which they write is the same language in which Linear B wrote. The script is different, but the language is the same. And that language is Greek. Linear B, a weird alphabet, or not alphabet, a weird script that disappears. Linear B, unlike Linear A, was deciphered. It was deciphered by a guy named Michael Ventris, who was a World War II code breaker and got interested in Linear B after World War II was over and he was, you know, didn't have any more codes to break. And he deciphered it and he figured out that it was Greek. So the language that people continued to speak, they didn't have any, uh, they didn't write anything down for a number of hundred years, but they, obviously they continued to talk to each other. And what the language in which they were talking is the same language when they finally start to write again that they, that they write. The second reason is because we can trace these people through the single largest category of material remain that's left. We get no more monumental architecture, no citadels, no walls, no tholos tombs, no monumental art, no frescoes, um, no shrines, but uh, people still need to eat and drink and to do that they need pottery vessels. Pottery vessels were the most common thing in which, that, in which people used to cook their food and, and they decorated these vessels and we can track the, um, the moving around of people and the date by the devolution of pottery style. So, um, in, the, in the years of the Mycenaean palaces, here for example is one of these stirrup jars with these, one of these google-eyed octu, octopi. And uh, in the next century, in the 12th century, uh, here, here's a jug. And this is what the design now looks like. It's recognizable from this. You can tell that it's a, a version of this. Whoever made this um, is sort of channeling this, but it's just not, you know, not as fancy. About 100 years later, this is what happens to pottery styles. And then about 50 years later, well, it's hard to imagine an octopus here, but um, you know, this looks pretty nice now compared, compared to this. So, so you can see the shapes still stay basically the same. Uh, it's just that people do not have time or energy or interest for uh, these more elaborate, even semi-pictorial decorations. Decorations devolve into a kind of um, bunch of curve, curves and, and bands. And... Uh, this is, uh, this is yet another version. Now, how is it that we know that um, time-wise it goes from the fanciest to, the, to this sort of decoration? Because we don't have in this 200-year period between the collapse of the Mycenaean palaces um, and about 1000 BCE in Greece, we don't have any settlements. We don't have any houses, we don't have any villages, no towns, no cities. What we have are um, cemeteries. We have burials, we have graveyards in a sense. Not, and I say graveyards, but it's not like we've got tons of these things. But in a few places where we have them, um, the graves, which are below ground and uh, not marked, there's no markers, uh, are built in such a way that you can tell that one must be later or earlier than another. They're, they're not laid out in some kind of neat arrangement. And because of that, you can put the graves in order, relatively speaking, one relative to another, and then you can put the finds that are in the graves in order. 
So this, for example, comes from a burial in Athens. It's this pot right here. And there is a continuous series of burials over the couple of hundred years from the devolution of the Mycenaean citadels in Athens. And so we can track the um, style of pottery. And what that allows us to do is, relatively speaking, date, um, date the, the burials. So for about 200 years, uh, the city of, or the, the area around uh, modern day Athens had a community, a community lived there, and it was a very poor community. The burials are single burials. They have a few poor grave goods, um, like this fellow who's got one amphora, this one amphora here. And then, in uh, around the year 1000, stuff starts to get better. The goods in the burial start to get better. The looks like people have started to acquire a little bit more spendable income, some of which they, the goods from which they put inside their, their graves. So here, here we are looking at the Acropolis of Athens, city of Athens, which is the main city in Attica. This was just like Mycenaean Tyrans and Pylos, a Mycenaean citadel. Here on the Acropolis, there are traces of the Cyclopean wall of the um, Mycenaean palace that was likely on top of here, Megaron Palace, that was likely on top of the Acropolis. You have to ignore the Parthenon if you can. Um, so that wasn't there yet. Uh, so, so there, so there is there is evidence both on the Acropolis of the city of Athens of these um, of this its importance as a Mycenaean center, and down in the flat area below the Acropolis, standing on the Acropolis, looking down here, was a cemetery. That burial that you just saw, uh, that sub Mycenaean burial from the middle of the 11th century BCE comes from that cemetery below the Acropolis, and so does this burial, which comes from around the year 1000 BC. Now you see these terms, sub-Mycenaean, proto-geometric, so sorry about this. This is a little compulsion of archaeologists. We are very label happy. We are sort of just stamp collectors at heart. We just like to put things in order and then attach neat little labels to everything as if that explains it all. And the labels are... Um, not exactly explanatory. I mean, they don't really tell you anything about life and culture, but um, they help us um, by, because they link a period of time to usually a style of pottery that was prevalent at that time. And the reason that archaeologists are so hot on linking periods to pottery styles is because pottery is so darn common. You cannot get away from it. Just thousands of sherds. Uh, even when it breaks up, sometimes there's decoration on a sherd, and so you can date it even if you don't have a whole pot. So archaeologists are very, very fond of pottery on account of this reason, and a uh, little, little hyper-attentive to it. And the style of pottery in around the year 1000 BCE is called proto-geometric. John Pedley, in his book, I believe, explains these terms, why they have these names. He perhaps goes into more detail than you would ever even care about, but that will save me from going into the detail that you might not care about. Anyway, let's just agree that um, we've now left the Mycenaean world physically, chronologically behind us, although the stories are circulating and the walls are standing, and when people dig down to bury somebody, sometimes they find earlier burials with some of the great goods of these earlier burials. Now, uh, here's a grave from Protogeometric Athens around 1000. It's a single cyst grave. A cyst is C-I-S-T, not C-Y-S-T. And it's... Um, just a shallow grave dug into the ground, and it's lined, as you can see with these stones. And um, this single cyst grave is an inhumation. An inhumation is a burial where the, the person is actually laid out. 
as opposed to a cremation where they're they're burned and then the ashes are put in something. Single cyst burial, it's an inhumation. There are, uh, there's an array of cute little jugs and juglets that were put inside the burial and some um, wealthier gifts, bronze pin and earrings and rings. Metal, about 75% of the graves of this period, this proto-geometric period, around 1000 BC, have metal in the grave. Not all the graves are inhumations. Some of the graves um, at this time period, from around 1000 to now down to around 900, 10th century, and um, into the 9th century BCE are cremations. Here you see an, uh, an archaeologist, a, a, a workman, um, at the beginning of finding one of these cremations. And what you can see from looking at this picture, the reason that I put this picture on here, is if you wouldn't dig, you wouldn't know. There's no marker. There's nothing sticking up. Once the burial is uncovered, you can see that um, there's, there are a lot of goods inside here. The burial was a cremation. The ashes were put inside this large vessel. A stone was put on top of it. Uh, and then a lot of goods were put down in the pit with this burial. Here's the amphora. An amphora is a kind of vessel that has two handles, like ambidextrous. Amphi is the Greek prefix for both. So an amphora is a jar that has two handles in general. And this kind of amphora, uh, because it has, and I really have a good reason for telling you this, because in a minute I'll tell you something that's connected to this. So this is not just arcane trivia for to dazzle your friends at cocktail parties with later. Um, this kind of amphora, whose handles come off of the neck of the jar, is a neck amphora. In this neck amphora were ashes, and so um, on account of that, we wouldn't necessarily be able to identify the gender of the person. But the fines that accompanied this burial strongly suggests that it's a male who's buried in this amphora because, first of all, wrapped around the handles is a sword, a bronze sword, that one might conclude belonged to the man whose ashes were inside the amphora, and the sword was killed. It was deliberately damaged and, and put inside here so that uh, even if somebody was so bold and immoral as to dig up the burial and look to take out any valuable remains, they wouldn't be able to use this sword. It would have been, it would have been effectively dismembered. And in addition to the sword, there were a lot of other pieces of weaponry and um, utilitarian objects. Uh, so so um, tools, a knife, and a chisel and pin, an axe, but also pieces from, uh, from a bridle. So uh, horse, horse bits and a couple of large, large spearheads. Here's another burial from Athens right around the same time, just about 50 years later. This burial, also a cremation. Um, here's the, the cremation pit, all of the objects inside. And, and here's a drawing. So this is the ground level. And then everything crammed inside over 50 pots, over 50 vessels inside um, this burial. And here's the amphora. You see immediately that the handles are in a different place. The handles now, instead of being off of the neck, 
are on the sides, which we in pot parlance call the belly of the jar. And so that makes this a belly amphora. Now, just like with the male burial, with the killed sword, you can't know from the ashes what the gender is of the person who's buried inside, but some of the other finds with this burial suggest that the person whose ashes were inside was female. And in fact, in geometric burials in Athens, and we have many, this pattern holds throughout. Belly amphoras are for women, neck amphoras are for men. Um, the finds inside here include these fantastic old earrings and this beautiful faience necklace with this um, uh, elaborate bead and this really weird, very strange vessel um, that is called a pyxis. A pyxis is a sort of all-purpose pot word that means this is a kind of a strange vessel that I don't have another good word for, but generally it means a vessel that um, has a lid that can be opened and closed. And you see uh, that this, in fact, is a lid. This piece of the vessel comes off. And the knobs of the lid are awfully odd looking, and they um, are sort of cut off, look like a cut off egg shape. And they have an opening at the top and little openings at the bottom. And these have been interpreted as small version, um, sort of depiction of a form of a silo. And so this is thought to represent five large granaries. Um, and so that's why this is called uh, the granary pyxis. The, one of the reasons that this vessel is got what might strike you as an arbitrary explanation is because much later in Athens, a couple of hundred years later, when there is clear documented evidence for different classes, and the classes are defined by um, the, the contribution that uh, these people can make to the local economy or just the amount of money that they have, the uppermost class is a class that can contribute 500 medimnoi, which is a measurement like a bushel, of wheat every year, 500. And the explanation that most archaeologists uh, accept for this very strange little vessel is that this is an indication of somebody who could contribute 500, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, each of these being um, a silo for 100 medimnoi of wheat. And so this woman was a member of this uppermost class. Now, people don't need to bury lots of additional items in a grave. People don't need to demarcate uh, cremation jars in a certain way. People don't need to do any of this when, when folks are buried. But the people of Athens in the 10th and the 9th centuries BCE did. What are they telling you about their society at this time? Some things are being defined. Some things are being emphasized. Some things are being articulated. What are they? Just have a brief chat. I mean, are the men's less decorated than the women's? No, so it varies. No, the degree of decoration has everything to do with time period. Oh, okay. this is fifty years earlier. Earlier, okay. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that the man is on the neck corner, I was just getting the image of the guy going like this. You know, like showing off his muscles, and then the woman doing like this. You know, <laughs> Right. 
I always, <laughs> that's right. I always think, you know, big, big shoulders, big hips. <laughs> Who are you talking to? You don't have anybody to talk to. You guys, get close. I don't see any chatting. Chat. status because yes so so something that has reappeared that we had no evidence for for 200 years you can't say this is a tradition that's been maintained because we didn't have any evidence for it what you would have to say is that this is an idea an approach that has been reinvented class class is a category class matters enough to communicate it there's an interest in communicating which class you might be a member of what else So, so here in Athens, money, if you have it, some of your goods doesn't get passed on. It stays with you. So, there is, so another thing that's being communicated is that individuals matter in a, in a sense not for what they can contribute to some larger social group, but just what they have on their own. What, what they can take with them. A sense of individ, the individual right to hold on to stuff, to acquire stuff, to accumulate it, and then to, to, to take it with them. What else? Something else. What else is being advertised? What else is being communicated? Gender. Gender is a category. One gender is not more important than the other, but gender matters. Otherwise, you wouldn't have two different sorts of amphoras. Oh, this is a little hard to see. All right, um, 10th century. Early geometric. Ninth century, early geometric. This vessel here, the wealthy woman, amphora, early geometric. Uh, by around 800, that's what this says here, 800. Um, the, the Kinds of burials that I just showed you continue. Those happen to be two of the most spectacular ones. But there are geometric period burials. These, this is a burial amphora. There are goods inside the burials. This one is obviously for a man because it's a neck amphora. Um, what you see here is that the pots have, start to have more uh, decoration on them. The decoration is only geometric. It's just lines, boxes, triangles, all geometric shapes. There's just more of it. So um, we know that, that an amphora like this dates to, oh, I don't know, about 50 years later than, than an amphora like this. And then, in the middle of the 8th century, late geometric, two things appear that we haven't seen for about 450 
or so years. That's a long time. One is writing. Middle of the 8th century, writing. Here is a late geometric jug, the fancy Greek name for such a jug as an inakoui. means a, a wine jug. And you see that there is um, writing on this jug. The writing is not linear B. It's an alphabet. It's an alphabet that is perhaps even recognizable to you as the Greek alphabet. Where did the Greeks get this alphabet? They got this alphabet from contacts with the East. In the 8th century BCE, Greek traders, uh, Greek sailors, Greek merchants were shipping Greek pottery and other goods to the East. And uh, Eastern craftsmen and traders were likewise shipping and bringing some of their goods West. And we can trace the appearance of alphabetic inscriptions from Phoenicia, the homeland of the alphabet, in the 10th century BCE. This is a Phoenician inscription from Byblos. Um, 9th century, here's a Phoenician. These are the letters from a Phoenician inscription. This doesn't happen to be the inscription itself. This happens to be the letters in order of the Phoenician alphabet. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I mean, aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, sorry. Phoenician, not Greek. Um, here on Cyprus. And uh, the utility of this writing form, very handy, just 20, whatever, six signs, um, was adopted and slightly adapted by the Greeks. And here is the, the inscription that's on this little wine jug from Greece. It's called the Dipolon Oinakoui because the part of Athens that the jug was found in um, is the Dipolon. That's the area of the city of Athens that the jug was found in. So it's called the Dipolon Oinakoui. Um, and uh, uh, in, in this is, like I said, one of the earliest inscriptions that we have from Greece. There are others from the 8th century, um, same, um, same alphabet. Um, so, for example, here's a, a Greek alpha. And here's a Phoenician olive. Uh, there's lots of reasons to link these systems of writing and to uh, identify the Phoenicians as the, and the Phoenician alphabet as the um, immediate inspiration for the Greek alphabet. Uh, it's not only that the forms of the letters are the same, the names of the letters are the same. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, the, the two beginnings of the Greek and the Phoenician alphabets. Um, so the forms of the letters are the same. The names of the letters are the same. The order of the letters is the same. There's only one thing that's actually different, and that is the direction that they get written in. So Phoenician is written from right to left, but Greek, like us, is written in the other way. So the, the directions are reversed, but everything else is the same. Looks to be around the 8th century that the, that the alphabet um, is adopted by the Greeks. The other thing that suddenly appears, uh, reappears in the Greek world, again for the first time in about 450 years, are pictures. Late geometric pots, pictures. So here's this middle geometric amphora, no pictures. Late geometric amphora, pictures. Where did the idea for pictures come from? Well, to some extent, the idea for pictures came from the Mycenaeans. Now, you might wonder how that could be, since 450 some odd years has elapsed, 500. Uh, but in Athens, as in other places, burials took place in the same spot where earlier burials had taken place. And in Athens, for example, we know that there were Mycenaean period burials in the same area where the geometric cemetery was. And already in the early and the middle geometric period, 
fragments of Mycenaean decorated pottery that had been found accidentally when people had dug down to make a cyst grave were picked out and put inside geometric graves as additional grave gifts. So uh, sometimes uh, people would have found, for example, things like um, fragments such as this uh, Mycenaean chariot crater, and the specific sorts of scenes that appear on some of the earliest pictorial representations in late geometric art uh, copy, copy that. But that doesn't actually, that tells us maybe where they got the idea for some of the specific images, but it doesn't tell you something much more fundamental. Why now? Why pictures now? Why, I mean, if people had been seeing these old fragments with pictures for a few hundred years, why had there been no interest? Or perhaps the better question is to take that and flip it over um, and say, what is it about the world right now that inspired people to decide to make pictures on the pots. What, in other words, are the pictures for? What are the pictures for? Here's a late geometric, about 750 BCE, bowl, large bowl, very interesting shape. It's got a spout, two handles on either side with some standard geometric bands and little squiggles, and then one single large picture on one side. I don't have a shot of the other side, but it's a, it's a chariot procession. There are about four chariots with, with, a, with a man in the, in the chariot. What's going on? What is going on here? I tell you the basics, and then you're going to have a little conversation. So here are the basics. There's a boat, a big one. There are 50 rowers. Uh, the boat is docked, um, and the ladder is out, waiting for a man to ascend and get on it. One foot is on the ladder. One hand is on the the whatever that is, stern. Um, his shield is already on board, waiting for him. A woman stands to one side. She has on an elaborate gown. In one hand, she holds a crown. It, her other hand is grasped at the wrist by the man who's about to get on the boat. Who are these people? Why this picture on this pot? What is the story? Have a chat. Water birds are common, um, especially in argive uh, vases. But this, but the, the the bird here is probably not just decoration. It's it, it's it's probably indicative of a, of a deity, an epiphany of a deity, because it's very it's very specific the way it's situated. Because you see, in this picture, unlike a lot of geometric vase painting, there's no filler. <laughs> All right, what do you think? You with that nice cap on your head, so make it so easy for me to point to you. Yeah, she looks like she's being taken against her will. 
looks like an abduction. Um, because what are what are your what's your evidence? Right. This doesn't this doesn't look volitional on her part. Right. The the artist has been quite careful to uh, make it clear not only that he's hand, it's grabbing her by the wrist, but with her fingers spread like that, it, it makes it seem as if, you know, she's resisting. Um, but, but, this, but this is happening anyway. So it looks like an abduction. What else? Something else. She's, she is hanging on to something that delineates some kind of role, status, class, or identity. It's a signifier. The artist has given her something that signifies a position. So that's sort of weird that on the one hand, it looks that she's being taken against her will. And on the other hand, she looks to be somebody who's marked as important. This isn't casual. She's not just anybody. What else? So the boat is really, the boat is very important. The boat is, I mean, in fact, takes up the most of the front of the vessel. So that there is an emphasis on mobility. Also, it's this man, it seems to be this man's boat. It looks like he's the commander. He's the, he's the person in charge, the admiral or whatever it would be. The captain, that's the word I want. And so that would suggest that he's wealthy. We don't. No, even though there's a, he has a, a shield, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a warrior. These guys, we don't see weapons. The shield could just be the standard sort of protective thing, like, you know, you just want to have a piece of protection. Or it could be a signifier for him, the way the crown is for the woman, that, that he's somebody strong. But, but... The point about the boat is a good point, that this, in a way, the boat is almost like a signifier for the, for the man, for his class, perhaps his profession, certainly his abilities. Like, a, like an arranged marriage that was like overseas. Like that. Possibly something like that. Possibly something like that. Now, what... Could this vessel, what situation could this vessel have been made for? Because this is not a casual vessel. First of all, the shape is very specific. It's, it's practically unique. In other words, it must have been commissioned. We don't have hardly any of these, uh, this great big spouted bowl. It could be... Um, uh, could have been used for, um, for, for, for water, like for washing or something like that. I mean, it's not that it's not functional, but it's, it's, it's not casual. And the scene is not casual. You see that the scene is very deliberately placed. The bowl is, is made so that the scene takes up the maximum amount of space here. And the scene, unlike uh, the other vessels that you've seen where a lot of the emphasis for the, for the pictorial or the decorative area is in the middle of the vessel, here it's way up at the top so that it's, it's very clear and easy to see. What are possible situations for somebody to have commissioned this vessel? Think about life events. So this isn't going to be casual. This is not going to be, I'm having a dinner party next week, and I'd really like a good punch bowl. It's not going to be that. So think about the big events in life. What are the big events in life? 
You know, do you ever see these Tiffany's ads? Um, I don't know if nobody reads newspapers anymore, but <laughs> Tiffany's, you know, they make specific silver knickknacks for all sorts of life events, right? What are, what, are, what are the main life events? Birth, death, marriage. What was this made for? Probably a wedding. Is that what you were going to say? What were you going to say? Um, possibly, although there's, we don't have any evidence for, um, you know, we don't have any specific evidence for, for that. Possibly, but, but, but more likely a marriage. More likely a marriage. And if it's a marriage, what is the message about gender? Maybe so. He is taking her. She's subservient. She's important, but not as important. And it's, this is not a meeting of equals. 200 years before, we had those two big amphoras. We had that granary pixis and the wealthy woman's amphora. This lady is not that lady. Something is happening to the social makeup. This world that is being reinvented, class is there, gender is there, gender is turning into not just a position, it's a role. Pictures are helping to tell us how that is being perceived in this place and time. Okay, we're going to pick up on this. Um, next on uh, Tuesday. If you came in late, we had handouts, lots of handouts. Come down here, see Katie, and, and get the handouts.